let me introduce you the two gentlemen uh, on the stage as of now, ladies and gentlemen. We talked a lot about the you during the first portion of this debate, of course. Uh, now on to a country that, if you will, has been leading the EU, uh, the EU, EU leadership taking over the council. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have the Deputy Minister for EU Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Estonia. He's overseeing relations with the EU institutions during the <coughs> ongoing Estonian presidency of the Council of the EU. A pleasure to have him with us. Please welcome Mati Masikas, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, the gentleman next to him is the president of the European Forum, Altbach. It's a, it's a think tank uh, that has been in existence since 45. Uh, uh, you may know the annual European Forum, Altbach. I'm sure some of you have been in attendance there. They're hosting many more events, of course, and have been dedicating their work uh, to the solidarization and, and the future uh, of the EU. With us is Dr. Franz Fischer, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Mr. Masikas, let, let's start off. Uh, the <coughs> Estonian presidency of the Council of the EU is still ongoing. Uh, per, I'm sure it'd be of great interest to the audience if you could give us a quick overview of what up until now has been tackled and est established and perhaps accomplished during that presidency. Right. Thanks for the, for the introduction, and uh, it's a great, a great pleasure to be here. Well, uh, we were lucky. With the timing of our presidency, we took over uh, in a situation where the European economy is growing again, uh, and the recovery uh, seems to be sustainable, where the uh, support for the EU uh, has uh, increased in all 27 member states, where there is this um, renewed sense of unity. I think the, 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 the Brexit vote made us all think of what is there to lose. Uh, so the mood is much better, and with the, uh, and with the improved mood, um, people want to achieve more results. People are, are ready to do things uh, to do things together again. The big debates on the future of Europe uh, are still only starting. Mm -hmm. So our presidency's objective is to is to deliver concrete results for our citizens. For for whatever whatever is been done with the EU institutions, there is this basic instinct in Europe has always been there. Uh, when you. When you, when you encounter a problem uh, or something that need to, needs to be fixed, you immediately start to think of the institutional setup, new body here and there, who gets what. And uh, this time around, uh, having learned from the Eurozone crisis, it's important to, to deliver concrete results for our citizens, for the EU to earn and to re-earn the legitimacy. So we are working with uh, we, are, we, are, we are focusing on the work with concrete files. Um, on the digital single market, to start with, digital is the, one, of, one, of the, one of the overarching priorities of, of the Estonian presidency. We are, we are moving on with all, the, with all the files. Migration would be, would be the second big issue, the crisis is far from being over, and the uh, recent history has shown that it's a very volatile crisis. Uh, things may, situation may change every day. We are, we are quite well moving with the, with the uh, reform of a common European asylum system. There is one big political problem, the, the crisis mechanism, if you will, the, the uh, reform of the Dublin regulation. But with, with the rest of the files, we are, we are we are advancing quite steadily. So, so the work uh, on concrete files, which is well ongoing, we still have almost three months to go. Mm, three months to go, enough time to uh, uh, make an impetus, if you will, uh, here and there, and migration, of course. Uh, Mr. Masika, as you mentioned it correctly, 
uh, one of the touchy subject matters. Let me also welcome in the midst now, since we talked about the ongoing Estonian presidency of the Council of the EU, uh, that will end in December at the end of this year. And then the torch, if you will, will be passed on to Bulgaria. And we're delighted to have with us the Minister for the Bulgarian Presidency of the Council of the EU, Liliana Pavlova, ladies and gentlemen. Please give her a hand. <laughs> Is, uh, with us, um, but let me bring in uh, Mr. Fischer now so you get a chance to adjust it for, for a second. I know you rushed uh, on stage. Um, let's talk about the immediate future. Let's not do, do a long-term view here, but really the, the very pressing issues, migration, refugees, obviously one that Mr. Masikas has pointed out correctly. You are somebody who's been at the forefront, not just of Austria's, uh, a contribution and role in the EU, but in general, shaping the debate uh, in the context of the European Forum Altbach. If you look at the EU today, where, where do you think, what are the most pressing issues that need to be tackled right away? Well, <clears throat> thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain a little bit uh, how I see the present situation. Because uh, I think, uh, as Mr. Weidenfeld, uh, he is a German politologist, once said, the identity of the European Union is pragmatism. And I think we have to be pragmatic, especially in the coming two or three years, because there are very concrete uh, decisions to be made. And it's, this is the refugee problem, clear, we have to find a solution within the, let's say, next year, basically, because um, I think the refugee issue is a kind of lachmus test within the European Union, whether we are serious about uh, cooperation or not. The second thing, uh, we should not forget that uh, the ongoing financing period comes to an end. And uh, this has to be negotiated. And uh, by the way, I think uh, the main negotiations must take place until, uh, until the end of the, or towards the end of the coming year. Because in the first half of 2019, we will have the election campaign for the European elections. And uh, as somebody said, uh, election campaigns are not the best period for political wisdom. Yeah? So therefore we should focus very much on the ongoing year and on the coming year. And um, to put it simple, uh, I don't see any member state uh, which would be prepared to pay more to make a bigger contribution to the community budget. So therefore it's a question of the distribution of the money. And there is the problem that we will miss six to eight billion euros every year because of the exit uh, of uh, the UK. So uh, the question is then, which policies should be cut? And uh, there are only two funds uh, which have uh, the necessary money uh, so that with a lot of burden and a lot of discussion, but in the end, uh, they will have to accept uh, the cuts and this is uh, the agricultural fund, and this is the regional fund. It is very simple in principle. But in addition to that, there are many demands for additional expenditures and ex additional spending. Think about uh, the discussion about the future cooperation with Africa or the uh, Marshall Plan with Africa. Think about uh, the integration issues. Uh, think about um, the sustainability issues, the energy issues, and so on. Uh, but we must be aware of the fact, whatever we do in addition, we have to find uh, the necessary funding for that. And this doesn't exist for the moment. I think this is a, a, a fundamental discussion and will, uh, will create a lot of burden on the member states so that they are able to find a common solution. And then there's the Brexit. And as things look for the moment, I would say the most likely outcome, whether we like it or not, will be that uh, the UK would leave the European Union without any agreement. 
And uh, this creates then also for the remaining member states some difficulties. Um, but uh, either the, the UK representatives uh, change their position or, uh, and this is, if you think, for example, about Martin Wolf, the chief commentator of the Financial Times, he is arguing, <coughs> or arguing all the time that this is the most likely outcome. This, uh, uh, I think, <coughs> if the union is able to manage these three very difficult issues within the next two years, then uh, the feeling will come back that the union is able to solve problems, to solve common problems, and this would then be a very good base uh, for, the, uh, for, for the period beyond. Many pressing and fundamental challenges awaiting the EU in the next two years, says uh, Franz Fischler. Next two years is one thing, but let's talk about the next six months, perhaps. Uh, that's uh, when your country, uh, Ms. Pavlova, obviously will take over the uh, torch and lead the presidency of the EU Council. We already heard from Mr. Masikas what the Estonian presidency has accomplished or intended to accomplish. Perhaps would you be so kind to share us your intentions, your ambitions uh, uh, for the Bulgarian presidency? I'm sure many of the issues and challenges that have been laid out throughout this discussion are very dear to your heart and your country as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, maybe in uh, continuing what was already started, I can fully agree that we do have now the three challenges ahead of us, which are the, the challenge of uh, Brexit and the discussion and how we end up, uh, how we end up this divorce. It's a... Uh, it's an expensive exercise we need to, to complete. And uh, the result, uh, obviously, is something like uh, 15 billion uh, euro less in the overall budget. On a, and then, more or less, it's 15. Over the period, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for the whole period. But we need now to plan that we have the new period yeah, uh, starting. We have uh, new challenges, new funds, and new needs. And uh, finally, we all need not only to have the cuts, but then we, ha we have the new funds agreed, we have the new challenges. We all ag ag agreed that the, the new challenges are something important to cover. And uh, that's why one of the key focuses and the priorities which we have uh, ahead of the Bulgarian presidency, but then with Austria and uh, Romania, hopefully to be able to complete the most of the debates by uh, by spring of 2019 because we need to be successful before May 2019 elections. Uh, it will be a very positive sign if before the, the elections for the new European Parliament we close the debates. We have more or less agreed on the framework, on the, uh, at least on the draft regulations, on the draft multiannual financial framework. It will be a very positive and a very good sign that the, in, for the future of the EU even though we do have a lot of challenges, we do have a lot of still things to find a compromise sometime, to find uh, the balanced position, we, uh, we, uh, we will give a good sign. Otherwise, we are going to, to, uh, to, to the elections. Then we have the new parliament, uh, then starting the voting and the new commissioners, the new commission, the new president. We lose the momentum. Then with the new approach of the new uh, parliament uh, elected, with the new commission, uh, we will. We might risk, as it happened already in the, for the programming period 2014-2020, we lost the first year. It was uh, because of the late approval of the regulation, late start of the programs and the funding, and it was not in favor of our economies, of the competitiveness of the regions as well. So uh, we need to be more ambitious and now uh, really debating, starting working on, uh, on that point. We as a presidency, we are planning and we do expect uh, after the discussion with the Commissioner, Commissioner Oettinger, with the President Juncker's speech, it was mentioned as well, in spring next year to have the draft proposal of the next multi-annual financial framework. Uh, from that respect, we are planning already in February, March to start the debate on the next budget, on the challenges, on how we combine the new challenges and the new funding needs with the, uh, with the traditional policies and funding of the, 
of the treaty, like the cohesion policy and like the the common agricultural policy, because uh, we uh, we definitely need to continue working and uh, investing throughout these policies for the development of the region, of all the regions. I mean, in uh, in uh, EU 27. Uh, because uh, otherwise we have the risk of deepening the disparities between between the region in EU and at the same time trying to work and to uh, to support uh, Africa uh, and the fund for Africa and support uh, the, the new funding so this is this is one of the key priorities which we are planning and in May when we have the draft uh, already multi-annual financial framework already to have a streamline, to have conclusions of the presidency and to outline what are the, the next steps to, and to, to reach an agreement, I hope, to reach a consensus or even a compromise. What are the cuts? How we become more efficient with less funding? How we can do more with less funding? This is, this is the big question but, and we need to find uh, an answer. But the starting position, the starting point, at <coughs> least for, for us, and this is our position, but this is uh, already commonly shared position between the, yep. uh, with us and Romania, is that we shall not be divided on East and West, rich and poor, but we shall be lo looking for unity. And that's why the motto of our presidency is united, we stand strong. This is, this is the key message we would like to say, really, unity is, is in danger. So Bulgaria sets forth an ambitious agenda uh, for the beginning of next year, that's for certain. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Mr. Masikas, even during this short exchange, it's clear that uh, uh, the EU is in a difficult spot. It, it, aside from the challenges, many people are even saying uh, it's in a dysfunctional state. It's in a dysfunctional state where the, where the continent has become stagnant uh, and is not not uh, uh, is able, but perhaps not ready to to move it to the next level. Because moving it to the next level would mean more Europe. Would mean more Europe. I would assume on every level that that we're talking about. If go ahead. Has, has always meant. Has, has always, always meant. meant during the the sixty plus years of the of the European integration. Yes. Let me start by um, sort of start with the with the eurozone crisis. Um, if you if if you'd ask me uh, what makes me optimistic about the about the future of Europe, uh, that's, uh, that's the way that the EU did manage uh, the eurozone crisis in the in in. 2011, not a week passed um, uh, when, uh, when uh, some very wise people in very respectable newspapers would not have written that a monetary union, a currency union, uh, with this kind of institutional setup and with such a level, a low level of coordinated economic policies cannot be sustainable, cannot survive. Eurozone did survive, indeed. Nobody had to leave. Um, we did manage, and some of those uh, wise uh, commentators uh, even recognized afterwards publicly that they underestimated the huge political will that is keeping the Eurozone together, that is keeping uh, the EU together. It's even, even for a country that, um, that acceded to the Union only in 2004, uh, even for us, it's, uh, for me, it's, it's a positively surprising to see, uh, to feel how the generations of, of politicians have invested, or leaders have invested so much, so heavily into the European uh, project. It will not be that easily be left just uh, to wait um, to wade away. So, so uh, the way that that uh, the way that the EU managed, I, I don't want to use the word muddled through, but managed the eurozone crisis, gives me gives me the the uh, uh, the ground uh, the ground for optimism. Now it's the question whether and there are two schools have always been, uh, two schools um, on the on the future of eurozone. One said, well, we did manage, didn't we? So no big changes are needed. 
and there is this other school uh, saying uh, in order to be prepared for the next crisis. And we have always said, we have always known that the institutional setup is not satisfactory fully and, and, and level of policy coordination is not satisfactory. We need now to use this momentum to, uh, to move on uh, to deepen integration. And this is the core of all discussions of the future of Europe. There are other issues like defense, mm -hmm. but, but the core question of the, of, the, of the future of Europe discussion is, is this Eurozone integration, the Eurozone setup question. And, and that is, we are very far from, from even getting close to a, to, a, to an answer, to a, to a decision, to a direction. Mm -hmm. Sir Fischler, uh, I, I know you wanted to jump in here. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first, I would like to add one thought to the former discussion which we had. Uh, I think we should not uh, forget that uh, we should not limit the discussion about the future financing of the Union to budget cuts. Uh, I think at the same time, this is also an opportunity, especially in the, with these two funds, with the agriculture funds and with the uh, regional funds, to do substantial reforms there. And uh, substantial reforms are in both sectors absolutely necessary because in the regional policy, uh, I would say uh, the regional policy for the future is uh, not enough targeted. And uh, in addition, uh, the financing instruments used are rather old-fashioned and uh, I think uh, it is also necessary to take into account in the regional policy uh, some of the fundamental difficulties ahead of us. For example, digital divide yeah, or many others. Uh, this, is, uh, this I think we should be aware of. Um, if we then look further ahead uh, to the next decade. Uh, here I would then argue that um, we are facing several really fundamental uh, challenges which are in principle manageable, which can in the end also uh, provide us with totally new opportunities, so it's not only about burdens. Uh, we are speaking here about uh, the consequences of climate change. We are speaking here about uh, digitalization and the Estonian presidency. I think it was a, a good thing that they put this issue on the table. We have a fundamental social problem in Europe because we are the oldest population in average uh, in the world. <coughs> and uh, we have to be aware what consequences this will have. And uh, we have uh, difficulties with our energy policy and with sustainability. Mm -hmm. I think these are the, the main fundamentals we have to deal with. And I would like to make, here, uh, to make you aware of one thing here. First, this is not a pure European issue. These are issues for many countries and uh, many parts of the world. Second, I think it is really important to realize that these are all long-term problems. So you can't solve any of these problems within an ongoing uh, parliament parliamentary period or uh, within a period which is the planning horizon mm -hmm. of, a, of right. a political party. Mm -hmm. yeah? right. And this creates an additional difficulty because from a, from a tactical point of view of a political party, for example, it is not very attractive to deal with these problems. And uh, therefore, who then should deal with them? And uh, this is therefore so important for Europe that Europe is able to deal with these things because the, uh, the planning horizon of, uh, of the European Union is a bit longer. And in addition to that, uh, I think very important is that we are aware of the fact that this is not only an issue for politics. This goes much further, involves the whole societies and uh, uh, from, from the politics, uh, but also uh, the scientific sector, the business sector, the uh, civil society and so forth. 
And the question is, and this is, and this has then also a certain relevance, how we design the future institutions in the European Union, uh, how do we bring this uh, these things together, these mm -hmm. institutions uh, together, so that they start working more in a cooperative way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and finally, uh, I think it will be important also that we realize that with the traditional methods, how we manage politics, we will be unable to deal with these problems also because um, we are used to think in boxes. And if we don't go out of the boxes, if we don't realize that we need much more system thinking, if we are not able uh, to reorganize our administrations in that way uh, that they produce their politics more commonly, I think then we will be in major troubles. So uh, not only our new strategies are needed, but a whole new way of thinking that is, right. is not restricted to politics and politicians, but as a task for the entire European population and society. Uh, Ms. Pavlova, I know you wanted to uh, respond to what's been said. Yeah, I just wanted really to add something because I fully agree. We need to think out of the box. We need to be more flexible. We need to uh, not only to think out of the box, we need to look beyond the EU and the European Union itself because it's uh, our younger generation and we, we, this is the priority, the young people living, working or educating in Europe, but now in the global world they're traveling all around. So we need to go not only out of the box, but we need to go be much beyond the borders of the EU. And that's why in that uh, perspective, uh, something important to mention for the Bulgarian presidency, the key, the top priority of the Bulgaria, Bulgarian pres presidency are the Western Balkans. We, we believe we might uh, start this uh, position and being the presidency for the Balkans as well. So our key priority are the, welcome, uh, the, the Western Balkans in three perspectives uh, of the Western Balkans uh, European perspective. First is the, really the, the European gui uh, guidance to the European uh, uh, integration, uh, but uh, important note to, to take and to give, it's not giving false expectations at all. We are not willing to give and to provide any false expectation for a quick accession of the Western Balkans. On the other side, we do need helping them working with them, providing them not only necessary guidance, but a very frank, very sincere analysis what, where they are with the preparation, uh, what is the way forward, and then we have in uh, March uh, next year the conclusions of the, of the European Commission on the enlargement, uh, the annual conclusions. Based on them, we want to prepare for each and every country of the Western Balkan the, the, clear, uh, the clear path, the clear deadline, and then supporting them. The second dimension of the Western Balkans priorities is the connectivity, uh, a very important thing to, to, uh, to work on because uh, uh, the connectivity is something which will provide the, the European perspective of, for the citizens, not for the political mm -hmm. elites, but for the citizens. Citizens need to feel that they are part of, the, of Europe, not only geographically, they are part of the, the family, let's say, and we do really take care of them. So the connectivity has its uh, five dimensions, I might say, the, which is the road connectivity, the trans-European corridors, the transport corridors, the rail connectivity, um, the air connectivity, we don't have direct flights to our capitals in the Western Balkans, for example, from Sofia, which is, mm. which is, uh, which is a pity. <laughs> Sorry? And then the energy okay. connectivity, important. And last but not least, digital connectivity. Uh, even the roaming taxis are a good example that we need to be open from the, uh, removing the more roaming taxis. And the third priority for the Western Balkans, a part of the long-term major priority of the EU is the security and migration. As well, they do suffer from the migration flow on one side, and on the other side, security from the anti-terrorism and the radicalism which we face there, so uh, we need uh, to support them, we need to, to be united there, and uh, working, and we are grateful for here for, as well in the partnership of the, with Estonia, with Estonia, within the Estonian presidency, now we have this month meeting in Sofia, 
uh, in the calendar of the Estonian presidency, specifically on justice and home affairs, and uh, in the format EU Western Balkans, start uh, discussing and debating, debating already debating on those on those issues. So this is uh, the line for the Western Balkans, which I wanted to, to mention as a part. And just one sense, uh, sentence to make: Yes, indeed, we should not be focused on cuts. We should we should be focused on the impact of funds. What, uh, what is the impact of the funding of all the policy mechanism we do have? What is the added value of the investments rather than cuts? Because we are not accountants. Mm. We need to think of the politics, of the policies and their impact on the citizens. So Thank an you. emphasis on the Western Balkans. And when it comes to uh, the digital connection, I think there's no country that uh, leads with greater example than Estonia. Uh, so in that, that field, certainly uh, many uh, European countries can learn from from Estonia. At this point, I would like to bring you in. I would like to get your questions and comments uh, to, to uh, wrap up uh, this, uh, this session. We already have a couple of gentlemen raising their hand. Let's uh, right here. The microphone is coming to you, sir. Please introduce yourself quickly. Hi, yes, I'm a professor of international relations. Uh, at the China Foreign Affairs University, based in Beijing. It's really a great uh, pleasure you know, to join this forum. So at my university, I teach European integration in the European Union politics and its external relations. I quite appreciate the remarks made by our three distinguished panelists concerning uh, the, the future of Europe and its immediate challenges and task of facing the European Union. So here, let me just pose two questions. First concerns the European integration process. Uh, so following the presidential election in France this May, and the recent election in Germany, so there has been growing expectation for a greater role for France and Germany so in the European Union. So I'd like to to know how our three panelists, <laughs> how they, how you look at the future relationship between France and Germany, and what possible concrete steps taken by the two governments in areas of furthering the integration process in the European Union, and what possible cha changes that could take place in the areas of European integration. My second question would concern the TTIP, the transatlantic relations. Yes, everybody knows, you know, during the Obama administration, so the two sides, they failed to reach a deal. Now with President Trump in office in the United States, and with his, with his opening doubt about the free trade, could there be a future for the negotiation between the United States and the European Union. Could the negotiation deliver any possible results in the near future? Thank you. Thank you so much. In the interest of time, uh, we'll collect a couple of questions. Uh, I know there was another gentleman raising his hand. Right there. Go ahead, please. Mine was actually a follow-up on his first question, which was nine days ago, uh, President Macron gave a speech outlining his future of Europe, which had one element was, uh, you know, greater uh, federalization and flexibility regarding funding within the Eurozone, but also outlined what was a pretty clear two-speed Europe. I'd like to s hear what your response was to the Macron speech. Right, thank you so much. Do we have uh, more remarks, more questions? If not, uh, we'll put a lid on it, give you some more time to reflect and think. Uh, um, let's start with uh, the first question, the integration process. Both Germany and France, obviously, had uh, recent crucial uh, elections. Um, uh, Franz Fischler, perhaps we'll, we'll start uh, with you. I know Austria is, is having one <laughs> coming up uh, already, uh, the, the uh, tenor and, and uh, yeah. <clears throat> the Franco-German alliance has had uh, a great yes. history and importance in the future of the EU. Can it be revitalized, particularly in light of Brexit? Well, I would say, um, it is not a correct question to say, can it be revitalized? Because this would mean that it is almost dead at the moment, and this is not true. 
between France and uh, Germany, there are working groups working already for several months. So they, they don't start working now. The only problem they have at the moment, because everybody in principle was expecting that after the German elections, there will be an, an announcement uh, for certain uh, German uh, French initiatives. Uh, one can then uh, think whether it's good or not uh, that always the Germans together with the French take the initiative because in principle under the European constructions it would be the job of the Commission to do that in, in principle. Uh, right. But as, when you followed uh, this, uh, the Juncker speech and when you followed the Macron speech and when you looked what happened with this so-called White Book, uh, then you can see that Juncker tried uh, to some degree uh, to, bring for, to come forward uh, with issues which he knew at that time that they are discussed with, uh, behind the scene, uh, the scene between France and Germany. Uh, so um, I would say uh, we will, this, there's a certain delay now because uh, the uh, formation of the new German government will take more time. Uh, than expected, but in the end uh, we will see, let's say, in the end of the year, beginning of the coming year, um, an initiative dealing with issues like strengthening the single market, uh, with the issue of the Eurozone and strengthening the Eurozone, and in this context uh, there the there is not much common sense, I must say, about the common finance ministers, uh, minister or about the Eurozone budget. This, uh, this is very sensitive and uh, I think uh, the Germans will not accept that. Um, and there are a few other things related to integration or to the refugees and, uh, and some other things. But uh, we will see such, uh, such an initiative. And uh, about the transatlantic relations, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, uh, it is a real pity that we lost the opportunities already several years ago to complete the Doha round. And uh, after 2008, the atmosphere was poisoned and uh, multilateralism nowadays it has al almost disappeared. Uh, you see only bilateral agreements, trade agreements, and, and, and not much more. And uh, the US takes more and more the position that they have even uh, reservations vis-a-vis -vis bilateral mm -hmm. agreements and uh, are for a cl clear protectionist uh, position. Uh, we need trade, like China. China needs trade and Europe needs trade. Foreign, uh, foreign trade is one of the engines of uh, the wealth in Europe. Uh, and uh, therefore, we should not, uh, we should not believe uh, that uh, trade relations and trade rules are no longer important. Um, whether it would be possible to take a new initiative I don't see this for the moment. The European Union, I think, uh, will try uh, to find a deal uh, with Japan, a trade deal, and uh, sooner or later also with the Mercosur countries. Uh, the, and then there will be a, a, an, easy, uh, an easy deal like the, the Korean model with Singapore. Uh, so, uh, this is what we can expect in, in the trade relations. Yeah. And the last point which was made, I think this is a very important one. I think you both are very much interested in this point, uh, so therefore I will not say much to it, but this is in principle uh, to an improvement of subsidiarity. Uh, the President Juncker in his speech before the European uh, Parliament two weeks ago, he announced that he will establish um, a task force uh, for the strengthening of subsidiarity, uh, and he did that, uh, but uh, uh, now we are waiting for the first 
uh, discussions and mm -hmm. results. All right, Th thank you for your input to the question. Let's, uh, from Mr. Masikas, I'm sure uh, many things to say as well. Uh, just a couple of follow-up comments, uh, mainly on the, uh, the Franco-German engine um, for cooperation. No big thing, no big initiative can, uh, no big solution or decision can be taken <coughs> pardon, in the EU without, without uh, active participation and, uh, of, of, uh, and, and active, active support of, of France and Germany. But in the Union of 28 or 27 soon, uh, it's, it's no longer enough. And, and they, these two uh, major players need also to, to learn some new ways in, in keeping, and they are learning, in, in keeping the others uh, on, board, uh, on board as well. Um, Angela Merkel, uh, in fact, in Tallinn last week, um, met President Macron in the margins of the, of the Tallinn, Tallinn Digital Summit and, and declared, announced that Germany is open to discuss Macron's ideas. And it is a big step, um, in particular, if you look at the, at the, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, well, everybody knows that, that she will now start to form a new German government. While, uh, while saying this, um, declaring this, uh, she sort of committed for the next German coalition and government as well, and this is significant. Um, I, w I, I agree on, on all the areas that you pointed out, um, Mr. Fischler, um, about the Franco-German uh, possible new initiatives with the exception of the single strengthening of the single market. I will uh, want to live we'll till see. that to date. <laughs> um, it's not really, um, has always happened at the initiative of, of these two, these two member states. As for the... Um, yeah, sometimes they think they alone are the single market. Uh, that's the yeah, problem. true, <laughs> true, true. <laughs> uh, as for the, uh, on the, on the DTIP, I, I don't have anything to, uh, and maybe just that Australia and New Zealand yeah. uh, are in the pipeline as well. Uh, on the multi-speed Europe, multi-speed Europe is there. It, there is the Eurozone, there is Schengen cooperation, there is European patent, there are, there are a couple of other uh, enhanced cooperation, and, it do, I mean, and everybody are okay with that. It doesn't bother anybody. It starts to bother people when this multi-speed Europe, the ideas, the rhetoric of the multi-speed Europe is being, uh, is being used in an excluding way. So, well, you guys obviously don't manage, so we, with a smaller group, we go forward now. Uh, I've seen during the, um, during the Estonian membership, now 13 years old, we have seen a couple of times, a couple, couple of, of, of such, I would say, outbursts. And very quickly these, uh, these initiatives have been shut down, and this rhetoric has been shut down. All, uh, all the forms of cooperation in the EU they will be conceived uh, as, as open and inclusive. And if, and, and, and the, in the EU, we always go a long way, a long mile to, to, to include everybody, to, to try to build a consensus. And if then, after, after a long process of, of discussions between member states, some member states uh, are not ready to, to go along, then so be it, and 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 this is and this is okay, and this doesn't, this doesn't bother bother anybody. So so the multi-speed Europe uh, is. N I'm not concerned of these talks of the multi-speed Europe, as uh, as long as as the forms of cooperation stay open and inclusive. All right, Ms. Pavlova. Before we do uh, the final round of questions sure. and remarks. Go ahead, please. I will not have uh, much new remarks because I do support what was said by, by the previous two speakers. Baby, 
Uh, just to, uh, yes, to extend that for the transatlantic relations, definitely we do need uh, balanced progressive trade policy. So we need in the pipeline to have not only Japan, Mexico, New Zealand and Australia. So this is important. These are important partners of ours. On the, on the Juncker plans and the speech uh, and the multi-speed multi uh, Europe, definitely we are not in favor of multi-speed. Obviously, we've been working so hard uh, to have the unity, to have all the different countries together working on the disparity, looking for the minimizing the disparity, the differences. Yes, keeping the, the positive sides, uh, but uh, we need now to focus on how to have uh, more of us uh, speeding up, if I may say, uh, and supporting to speed up rather than just if you're not performing so well, okay, go to the corner. It's not fair, it's not uh, the right approach, so definitely we need to work uh, in a completely different direction as, as a direction of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of all the debates, the discussion and the policy we will agree upon because otherwise we are not rebuilding the new Europe and the initiative of France and Germany is really rebuilding, reuniting Europe and uh, this should be the approach but without dividing. Made it abundantly clear that two-speed Europe not being embraced and supported uh, in Bulgaria. The German-Franco alliance, a very important point, obviously. With the Germans uh, having to come up with a coalition, I doubt it will happen before the end of this year and, of course, TTIP. Uh, I'm looking into the audience. Let's do a final round of, of uh, questions, remarks, uh, something that you felt was missing throughout this conversation. The next one. Uh, will be moderated by my uh, esteemed colleague Tim Judah from The Economist, and that will, too, build upon, if you will, what is being discussed here today uh, about uh, Europe. Uh, Franz, go ahead. Uh, if there's no question anymore, uh, so I would only like uh, to make one comment on this multi-speed Europe issue, because uh, this is uh, important on the one hand, but very often misinterpreted on the other hand. <laughs> uh, First, uh, a kind of multi-speed or different speed, let's be more precise, Europe is already laid down in the treaties. So there is no further treaty change necessary. True. But the different speed Europe <coughs> means, first of all, that uh, the final goal should not disappear, that all countries participate. Second, uh, it is only about different implementation dates and not about different uh, principles. Um, and what happened, and you see this also in this so-called white book, where you have one of the options, which is called those who would like to do more can do more. And this is then interpreted as a multi-speed Europe. This has nothing to do, in principle, with multi-speed. Uh, this is only uh, an a la carte Europe, if you wish to say so. And this is really, uh, I, I, in this context, I fully agree with you that this has to be uh, refused. This cannot be accepted because we would then up with, uh, let's say, five different Europes. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, not, uh, not something uh, which supports integration. Mm -hmm. Perhaps to wrap up the session, I think it's fitting uh, to get a very quick uh, answer fr from all of you. Uh, the question, of course, is we're looking at the US in its current uh, state. We're looking at China, India, all these emerging powerful uh, countries. Do you really think uh, that Europe as an entity, as an institution, the European Union with the remaining 27 nations, can and will still play a vital role in international politics, can it still, aside from its soft power and its values, which uh, might be appreciated and valued abroad, but as far as really real politic is con concerned, uh, is Europe still a relevant factor in the international political arena? Let's start with you, uh, Liliana. Yes, the, the, the short answer to this question is yes, I, I do believe and I'm, I'm uh, positive about it that uh, Europe still can play a significant role. Uh, we need to, to boost, to maybe to reboost the economy, the economic drivers. 
uh, using the digital agenda because I mean the future is in the digital, something which is already covered quite well as a long-term perspective and uh, with a specific and more focus on the young people. The future of Euro are the young people. And we have uh, <coughs> great examples uh, today uh, uh, with uh, representatives from the Young Strategic Leaders Forum, all of them who embody that uh, that hope uh, for the future that uh, you display here today. Uh, Mr. Mazikas, we're going to, I know you have a bit of a Theresa May moment here, a lot of, uh, a lot of coughing, so we'll, we'll let you off Hopefully the hook. Hopefully no <laughs> <Yeah>. falling off. <laughs> uh, uh, same question to you, of course. First, of course, uh, first of course the economy. Uh, the economy and trade, uh, the EU will, even at 27, remain the biggest uh, the biggest uh, free trade area in the world and in the matters of trade, size matters. Uh, soft power, uh, yes, I believe integration model, the European inter EU integration model still, uh, still has attraction and will regain attraction for, the, for our neighbors in particular. On the harder power, on the common um, foreign security policy. This policy is not to be compared with the um, um, Union's core policies like common agricultural policy, cohesion policy, trade policy, and, um, and, and, and so on. It's, it's younger, it's more intergovernmental, it's consensus-based, it all has, it all has its, uh, uh, these all factors put, uh, put limits. If you look at, we have learned in the recent years in this field as well. If you look at, uh, if you look at the, the new type of agreements that the EU uh, has offered to, to the countries of origin uh, in the field of migration, the five African countries, for the first time, uh, for the first time, uh, the EU combines all the tools in the toolbox. There is, <coughs> there is, there is migration uh, element. There is uh, foreign uh, development aid element. Uh, uh, there are there are various uh, various elements. Cooperation in uh, in in uh, strengthening their security sector and so on and so on. So, so, and, and that's something that the EU has not done before. I mean, uh, we have had the CFSP, but uh, the development policy has been, has been driven by, uh, uh, by the DG for, uh, in the Commission for, the, for, for Development. So, so for the first time, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the Union is combining the, uh, these policies, combining its tools, and it's, it's a step it's a small step, but it's a step in the right direction. So I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic uh, for, the, for the common foreign security policy as well. Since 2014, the Union has learned a lot about, about the challenges and about its responsibilities in its neighborhood. Mm. And this, this, will not, this will not go away. The cautiously optimistic view from uh, Estonia uh, we're getting about uh, the future of Europe, particularly in regards to security policy, obviously. Uh, Franz Fischer, you get the last words. My la the last words. Well, not today. At not least <coughs> at home has always my wife. <coughs> so, um, but uh, about uh, the future of Europe, I think uh, sometimes uh, that it would be better to ask those who would like to join the European Union what the reasons for that are. So, because they, they know why the European Union is still attractive. And uh, maybe the insiders, those who are part of the European Union, sometimes uh, forget it. Uh, but uh, I would say that um, for the future, uh, the role of the European Union could be bigger than it is at the moment especially also in the context of uh, development cooperation. Who knows that uh, per capita, the European Union pays twice as much as the US for development cooperation, but we don't make out a lot of it. And I think at this stage, there would be an opportunity uh, 
first to intensify uh, the dialogue between uh, the transatlantic dialogue between US and, uh, and Europe because they are our allies, they are our partners, but uh, it, is, it would be worthwhile to rethink a bit uh, some of the elements of this uh, partnership. And in addition to that, uh, we cannot simply wait and see what's going on in the emerging world. The emerging countries are becoming more and more important, uh, and uh, I think here uh, would be a place where the European Union could take initiatives in new ways of cooperating uh, with uh, the emerging uh, countries. Uh, but uh, to make this possible and to make this happen, I think we should uh, uh, reflect upon the idea which was mentioned in the Juncker and in the Macron speech, and this is that there are ways in our treaties uh, to come to majority uh, conclusions and decisions also in the foreign policy sector and in the, in the defense policy sector. We must strengthen the common uh, foreign policy and the common defense or security policy. Um, and then I think we are on the right track again. We are on the right track if we fulfill all these criteria and necessary steps that are ahead of us. European, Europe looking ahead and beyond the next two years, ladies and gentlemen. That was the discussion we had basically in two back-to-back uh, -back panels here. Yeah, I thank you for your patience, uh, your, your active participation here. Uh, in this panel. Europe, of course, will be the topic that will be picked up again after the coffee break, uh, which will start now until 5 p.m. So thank you uh, for your participation, but mostly, of course, thank you to this wonderful panel, and we see them through and out with a wonderful round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.